that. Yeah, so archaeological finds made by members of the public in England and Wales. Um, it's hosted by the British Museum and it's freely available on the internet. Um, the link being here, I hope you can see my, my mouse in the centre of the screen. We've now got records of over 5,000 medieval matrices to the public user, uh, but over 6,000 to those who are logged in. So that includes unfinished records. And just over half of them are made of copper alloy. I should have used green and grey, shouldn't I? Uh, so just over half are the blue copper alloy ones and just under half are the orange lead ones. 2% are of other materials, that's mainly silver and gold, but we've also got a very few of jet or ivory. Um, because most of our finders are metal detectorists, the non-metal matrices are almost certainly underrepresented. Now, the fact that most of RCL matrices are found by metal detectorists, that leads to some biases. These are quite interesting biases, and I hope that they go some way to counterbalancing the biases of other data sets. And the first thing to say is that we have a lot of them compared to other finds on our database. And here you can see um, the, a list of medieval metal finds on our database in order of how many there are. Um, so those figures are excluding ceramics, and you can see that matrices are in seventh place after coins, buckles, um, and other strap fittings, and these vessels here, which are mostly fragments of metal cooking pot. Now, I, as a, as a non-medievalist and a non-historian, I find that absolutely amazing, that seal ownership was clearly so incredibly common, almost as common as strap ends. It, it just seems extraordinary to me and, and rather wonderful. But by contrast, conventional archaeological excavation has never produced very many seal matrices. And this is because excavation tends to concentrate on intensively occupied settlements where you're mainly working through layers of discarded rubbish. Metal detectorists, on the other hand, they tend to look at these extensive areas of landscape with machines that are designed to find metal objects, even though those metal objects might be few and far between. Um, another interesting thing is that our seal matrices are generally not cut, they're generally not defaced. They appear to have been lost in the middle of their use, not at the end of their lives. And because of this, and because they're not found in those layers of discarded rubbish, we think that they're mainly ancient accidental losses. And you'll notice that many of the other items on this list are also the kind of thing that are accidentally lost. The coins fall through holes in pockets, dress accessories fall off, items from horse harness, when they, when they fall off, they're never found again. But you can imagine that as they're all lost and tend to come from the top few inches of topsoil, there's no independent stratigraphic dating evidence for our matrices. We take our dates from those that have been established by archival scholars. We take our dates from documents insofar as we can. So that's one caveat to begin with. Don't trust our dates as being independent, they are not. So we borrow all these finds and we record them on our database, then we return them to the finders. And here you can see part of a Portable Antiquities Scheme database record. Uh, it's got seal matrix as the object type uh, up at the top. Um, and below there's a full description and a photograph, uh, often with a photograph of the impression as well. So that's in the small, um, the small uh, illustration below. We record the date, the dimensions, the weight, uh, the material, the date of finding, the precise find spot, and lots of other details. Now it's very easy to find all our medieval seal matrices by doing a simple search and then using filters. So you find search, search database down the left hand side, and then you do the usual thing you'd expect to do for any search. You, you group the words together with double inverted commas and then press search, the blue button. Now, what do you get? You get Every record which has used the string seal matrix somewhere in its text. Most of those are records of seal matrices, but you can select this as object type here down the right hand side in the filters by, by clicking on the correct one down there. And there's lots of other filters you can use to hone your search down to exactly what you want. Now you can of course just search for seal rather than seal matrix, but then you get more results and you may need to look through uh, the filters a bit more carefully to retrieve the ex exact data set that you want. Now, and if you don't register as a user, if you're just a public 
user, you won't be able to see any of the detailed find spots and you won't more seriously be able to download the data. But registering as a user is very easy. It's this little link up here, the button at the top of any database page. This opens up a form to fill in with your details. So if I log in, I get more tools to use on my search results. There are lots of different levels of access, but generally, if you're logged in as a registered user, you get these buttons, map results and export as CSV. Those are the two most useful ones. Starting off with mapping, we have de detailed and precise find spots for nearly every CL matrix. And if you choose map results, you will get a map, a kind of a map. It isn't a particularly attractive one. And more seriously, it only maps the first 2000 find spots. So this is the map it draws of all medieval matrices. Um, yeah, not that marvelous. The black symbols, they're single finds. The blue dots are a few found close together. The yellow dots are a kind of larger concentration. And as you zoom in, they all change to the black symbols. The database is much better, much more trustworthy at mapping smaller quantities. So I tried doing all our silver medieval matrices and you'll see the problem straight away right up in the north. Um, this one is a matrix right up at the top, matrix found on Bambara Beach, and it didn't make it into the 2000 find spots to be mapped. So the lesson from that is you can't necessarily trust our distribution maps. Best to check every dot. But on the other hand, it is one click of a button. It's an incredibly quick result to decide whether there's a real trend that's worth exploring. Now, how you might explore this. Well, let's go back to the CSV, exporters CSV button. That lets you export your search results as a CSV file. And you can use this to draw your own distribution map, which hopefully will be completely trustworthy, or you can open it as an Excel spreadsheet and therefore you can use the data in whatever way you like. But whatever you want to do with our data, and we would love you to use it, you do need to know about some potential pitfalls. The first one is that our database is, of course, not designed specifically for medieval seal matrices. It's got to accommodate every kind of archaeological object from Paleolithic flints to 17th century trade tokens. So it can't include the kind of seal specific standardized fields that we might like. We have to be creative um, in what we have to work with. And what we have to work with is basically ringed here two fields that we can use to subdivide the material. They're known as the classification field and the subclassification field, and a field that we can use to record the inscription. Now, at the moment, we're using the classification field to distinguish between personal seals and official seals and anonymous so seals, so those with mottos. But that data has only been added to about a third of the records so far. About a thousand have been flagged as personal and about 250 as anonymous. And that imbalance, I'm afraid, is almost certainly because I'm doing the work and I'm more interested in seals with names, as you'll probably have worked out from my slides and my examples. Uh, so we, we need much more work, uh, much more data cleaning done. At the moment, as you can see from this one, uh, we're using the subclassification field to flag up women's seals and double-sided seals, because again, I'm interested in them and I'm trying to write a talk about them. But it has occurred to me while thinking about this talk that we should perhaps instead be using that field, the subclassification field, to record the central motif. Um, I'm still thinking about that one. The inscription field, of course, allows us to search more easily for inscriptions. But our main field that we record all the information into is the one above. It's the description field. Um, and although we try to standardize terminology here, in practice, our recorders, and we have one in every county across England and um, a couple of people in Wales, our recorders are free to use whatever words they like to describe an object. So um, a pointed oval seal matrix like this one has also been called vesica shaped, lentoid, even elliptical. The tall ones have been called chess piece, pedestal, handled, almost often conical. And to some extent, you have to guess what the recorder might have called it. So it's very difficult to retrieve all of these consistently. Uh, in addition, we haven't yet standardized the way we record central motifs. So we can't consistently reveal all the seals with heraldry, all the seals with religious motifs or with animals or with architecture and so on. Um, I've got a little example. If you want to find all moon and star seals, 
you could try searching for moon. I did that here um, and I got quite a good sample, but I think I'm unlikely to have got all of them. A lot of people use what they might think of as a more objective term. They don't use moon, they use crescent instead. If you search for both words, you get three times as many results. I did then choose, I did try choosing star as well, but I got virtually every single radial motif as well. So I decided that wasn't a good idea. So we clearly need, need to standardize our terminology. Um, and maybe we might adopt the classification used by the seals in medieval Wales project. I don't know. But as the data set gets larger, of course, this becomes much more important. But the retrospective data cleaning gets much more difficult. And that's why I really need input from uh, sigillographers to help help us work out what the correct terminology should be. The problem at the moment is that much of the data cleaning that's done by experts happens in individual Excel downloads, in, downloaded by individual scholars. It doesn't work its way back into the database for the benefit of all of us. But on the other hand, on the bright side, we do sometimes record more detail than other databases because the objects that we record are lent to us. Then most of them go back to their finders. They aren't there forever in museums to be consulted again as questions change. So our aim is to replace the object with a record. So we have to add lots of detail that perhaps other more specialised databases don't. I'm going to finish off with looking at a little case study, that of unfinished matrices. And I think these are an area where maybe the PAS database excels. I can't imagine that many seals on documents were made with unfinished matrices. And they can tell us a lot about how matrices were produced, um, things like commissioning, manufacture, sale um, and, and use. Uh, and as you can see here, we've got a completely blank matrix at the top, uh, then two with the central motif, but no inscription. Um, and at the bottom, two where the inscription's name has been started, so we've got Sigil, but the person's name has been left off. Now, if we start searching with perhaps two words that have probably been used in most of these records, maybe blank or unfinished, this will pick up all records with either word in them. And also I ticked only with images because I want to be able to check them. Uh, and here are the results. Uh, you'll see at the top, the database reminds you what you've been searching for. I put a ring around that. But those records include things like a Paleolithic hand axe. I mean, that's not what we want at all. So the best thing to do is to filter here, the ring at the bottom, um, to pick up only the seal matrices. So we've got 124 in this case. Probably not all of them, but at least it will be a useful sample. So if we click on that filter, uh, and uh, scroll down further, we can see that not all of them are medieval, so we can filter for that too, cutting it down to 116 examples. And then we can perhaps just look at all those records or download them into an Excel spreadsheet, or we could quickly click map results and see if there's a regional trend. If you want to try it for yourself, the best guidance uh, comes from our finds recording guides. Those are also to be found on the PAS website. The two I think that you'll find most useful are the guide to recording seal matrices and the guide to searching the database. You can just Google for those. They're, they're, they're really easy to find. Um, and that's where you'll find our most up-to-date recording practice. So if we change what we're recommending our recorders do, that's where you find it. So in conclusion, um, I hope I've convinced you to have a look at our data, which isn't perfect, but it is really useful and really interesting. Um, and one of the most exciting things is that it's constantly being updated and enlarged. We normally record nearly 400 medieval seal matrices every year. Even this year, we've added them at the rate of roughly one every working day. So every day you could go and have a look at the seal of the day. Um, I'm going to leave you just for now with this lovely new one found in June this year. Um, and I'm afraid I haven't finished the record yet. It's also going through the treasure process, which is the, the um, English and Welsh way of claiming objects for, the, for museums. So it's not available for public view. It should be perhaps in about six months. So, um, so I'll, I'll leave you with this slide. Thanks.